We, the volunteers, were put in charge of kind of checking in with the artists, making sure that they were um, set, all set with their websites. And so um, one of the artists that I checked in with was Michelle Sosi Cisneros. She is of Santa Clara, Navajo, Laguna, and Mission Descent. She's a painter, native fashion designer, and entrepreneur, and her work is absolutely beautiful. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you, Caitlin. It was really great to work with you for the virtual winter uh, summer market. I mean, I'm, I think I'm totally confused. Now it's, win it's winter market. Um, and I think one of the things that has been the hardest since the beginning of this pandemic is challenging myself to become uh, more well-versed on the computer and trying to figure out what I'm doing. And right now I'm trying to work on the Indian world for the winter market and I'm about ready to yank all my hair out because it's just driving me insane. <laughs> I'll get there. Um, and my sisters are here, so I feel so good, Holly and Sue. And my other sister, Marion, who models my clothes and is one of my dear, dear hearts. I mean, you're my sister. Um, but like Caitlin said, my name is Michelle Sosi Cisneros. And this is kind of different. I've done presentations and talks before in other types of venues. And now that we're on a computer, I found myself just a nervous wreck this morning. I don't know why. Uh, I never find it hard to talk about myself most of the time. Um, but for some reason I did this morning, I've just been a nervous wreck, I don't know why, but now I'm over it. Uh, my background is I, I live in Santa Clara Pueblo. Uh, my my Tewa name is Sohuatung, which means basket in the mist. And it's kind of a tradition where when you're popped onto the earth, your aunties give you an Indian name and it sort of describes who you are. And I guess early on being that I knew I was always going to be sort of the oddball. There was no such word as mist into the Tewa language. So really my name translates to a uh, basket in the fog. So, <laughs> so uh, what's interesting is that, especially now that the winter months are upon us, I see the, the beautiful mist on the river in the early morning sometimes. And I think, wow, you know, uh, it kind of brings me back home. I'm also Navajo and I grew up in Winter Rock, Arizona and Marion and I actually have strong roots going back there because our, our fathers knew one another way back in the day. And um, we, I grew up between Tuba City and Winter Rock, Arizona, spent most of my formative years there. And then my dad just was sent to uh, Evanston, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago and he went to Northwestern University. So, and then when I was smaller, he was a law enforcement officer. So we lived in Phoenix and the Glendale area and then in the Chicago area. So I kind of got urbanized too, um, very young. And so my entire existence has been what I call crossing bridges and probably, you know, a lot of people who have backgrounds like mine, um, you, I don't know how to describe it. You kind of learn how to pop back into your reservation life. And then when you leave your home, you have to figure out how to navigate who you are in um, what I call the, the other world. And I think that's one of the things that has um, helped me over the years as you know, I tried to grow my business and I, when I got asked to do this, I was like really honored um, and always asked the question, like, why me? You know, I don't really think of myself as someone who puts myself out there a lot. I just, I just have a passion for what I do and there isn't anything that will ever stop me. I'll probably be uh, like some of my relatives and be painting on my last dying day, you know, doing something. So boredom never strikes me. I'm never at a loss for anything to do. Whenever I don't have work, I create work. Um, 
And a friend of mine just the other day told me because uh, I was donating to the cancer cause. And she said, asking me what I was up to and telling her what I was doing. And she goes, but always remember, there's always a little bit of luck in there. And I, I always have to agree that, yeah, for some reason, I, I was born under a lucky star because whenever I start getting to a place where I think, well, what am I going to do next? Something just magically always pops itself into my world. Um, so when I was writing down what I was going to talk about, it always, I always just cast that out because I end up starting talking about something. Um, but where I began really was in Winter Rock, Arizona. I am part Navajo and that was where my roots began. And for someone like me, it was really difficult. I didn't really uh, find my true passion in Navajo country. Um, I would find it later though. And my, my, my world revolved around Santa Clara Pueblo, Capo Awinge. And that's the Tewa name for where we live. It means people by the Valley of the Roses. And I think the reason was, was because in, out in Winter Rock, I was considered kind of like a half breed out there. Uh, I didn't fit in because I didn't speak Navajo. I didn't fit in because I was a little bit urban. And so many of my friends were all the kind of Anglo kids and the government kids. And that's what my world revolved around. But I felt really disconnected because my dad was not traditional. He didn't, he didn't really take us to see our family. I had to kind of find out as an adult who my relatives were. And I found that to be kind of sad. And I used to just dig and claw at my dad to, to tell me things, tell me who my relatives are. The only thing he would do would be threatening us to send us out to the sheep camp if we didn't behave ourselves. And um, we took it kind of seriously because getting sent to the sheep camp was no fun. <laughs> you were out there in the middle of nowhere with no running water and literally tending sheep and doing the grunt work. Um, so in the summer months, though, uh, we I would be sent up here to Santa Clara two weeks with my grand my my grandmother, my mom's mom, who I adored, and then the rest of the summer we were up here in Santa Clara, and my folks would come at the end of the summer on Santa Clara feast day to get us. And oh my gosh, from the time I was a little kid to now, Santa Clara represented my family. My blood is tied here. I would come here and all my aunts and uncles were here, all my relatives. We would dance, take part, have peace, be together. And when feast came, all that, that kind of churning started happening again and the sadness would return uh, because I knew that I was going back home and I struggled a lot. I was a very troubled teen. And art was the way I found who, you know, my place, I just, I could, I can be alone for days, weeks, months at a time. And as long as I have this studio behind me and some stuff to play around with, I'm perfectly content. And so, you know, as I grew older, I went through the same things lots of people went through. I had an alcoholic father, an alcoholic fam uh, family, a codependent mother uh, who enabled my dad. It was just, you know, it wasn't anything unique, but for me, it was a troublesome life. And when I got out of high school, and my parents divorced, and so when I got out of high school, I didn't really even think about things. I was just trying to kind of conjure ways to get out of Winter Rock. I was just, I'll do, I would do anything. And so what does a stupid 18 year old girl do when you're trying to figure out where you want to go? I found somebody that I, became friends with and we got married, you know, and that didn't work because we were both very immature, irresponsible young people. And then I, in my very young days, I had my little boy. And so my life just sort of um, went that way. But prior to that, in high school, I found myself drawing and I would um, love to be around art. And I don't tell people this very much, but the only reason I find myself discussing it with you now is because it played an important role in who I became. And 
a um, couple of my relatives were phenomenally uh, astounding trailblazers, and one of them was Pavlita Velarde. If you ever Google her, you'll you'll see that she just was one of those women that reminded me of women that stood their ground and really had she not done what she did, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing today because she really fought against the system to become who she wanted to be. And her daughter, Helen, who I uh, got to know as I was growing up, I was very close to them, but I knew them more as family than I did as artists, you know, the big famous artists. Um, but as I grew older, I knew that's where I wanted to go. Uh, I, they mentored me a lot and I really, found myself wanting to follow those footsteps. Um, and then as I grew older, you know, I would, I got into Indian, my Helen got me into Indian market in 1977. And that's when I did my first Indian market. And I remember packing up my little boy and putting on my stuff and my moccasins and wrapping up the paintings I did and off down to the plaza I went to go pedal my work and the first time I ever sold work I was just you know that was the greatest thing ever probably because I had money in my pockets and I was selling my artwork and so I was you know I was pretty happy oh then I was newly married and uh, life was good and during that time uh, I Back then, too, Indian Market, and Stephen and Marion can know this because we've all been friends that long, and back in those days, Indian Market just, it was just on the plaza. It didn't have all the snaking streets that it does now, and I think there was really just those artists that were on the plaza. And back in the day, celebrities weren't afraid to come out and be part of the crowd either. I met all kinds of people, and the person that I met who, even to this day, Day, I, you know, I just, it'll be a memory with that stays with me was I became friends with Robert Redford. He came by my booth and he bought some work from me and then he invited me up to Sundance and this was before it was in the city. It was up at his ranch and he paid my way and I just, I, it didn't occur to me really who he was because he was just that kind of a person that you forgot he was this world famous artist because he was so genuine about loving Native American people, its arts, its issues, everything. And, you know, I just had the greatest time. And I, I just remember those days. And why my life would take on a different turn um, was because the dysfunction of my family never left me. So alcoholism took over my life. And throughout my 20s and my 30s, I struggled with alcoholism and drug addiction. And I'm very transparent about it because people know me and, you know, there's no, it's made me who I am today. And so, you know, um, I think when you're in that place, the creator won't allow you to do the beauty that you think you can do. And little by little, I found myself just going under and it hadn't it had it not been for my aunt pavlita i would have been a doorstep away from being on the streets and she pretty much tried to help me out and it was to no avail because i think when you get into addiction and you're very young i always tell people when you're so young you don't know how to find your way out of things mm -hmm. and so that went on for a long time and finally you know Finally, there's always the straw that breaks the camel's back. And that sort of was getting closer. Uh, she wanted her house back, and I think she just sort of had it with me. And I knew it too. And something inside of me, well, and the other thing, of course, that always drives women to do crazy things, right, is some man will enter your life if you find your true love. <laughs> and that happened to me. And when I met my husband Murphy, that's sort of what switched my head thinking around. I thought, and he told me, I don't want to be, I, I love you to the moon and back, but I can't be with a woman who has all these addiction problems. And so I, I decided then that it was time to change who I was. And crazy enough, I'd go back to Gallup, New Mexico to a Navajo treatment center. And that was the end of it. I, I spent a, a good couple months there and got out and, 
realized that that was what I was leaving behind. I never went back and it might, and like, unlike many re people in recovery, I just knew the door was closed on it. I never, I never went back. And so I knew art was going to be my path, but I needed more structure than, than be, going back to something I knew wasn't going to work for me. So what I do is I got into law enforcement and, and, um, that's what I, that's what I did. I went down to the tribal offices to apply for a job. I went to actually went to go apply for a dispatcher job because I needed a job. And my boss who would become just the dearest mentor of my life uh, told me, you know what? It's a waste to put you in a no end job. I think you would be, you just have what it takes to get into law enforcement. And I was terrified. And so that's what I did. And he sent me down to, because you had to, I went to the Federal Law Enforcement Academy in Artesia, New Mexico, scared out of my wits. Uh, but, you know, it taught me something. It taught me that I was a lot stronger mentally and physically than I ever thought I was. And um, it was a job that's pretty thankless. And you almost don't want to say that now, considering what's happening in the country today. But I was very proud of what I did. And policing back then was... Uh, at least here in the Pueblos, was very community-based type of policing. And I saw us transform from sort of very small crimes to pretty major stuff. And so, you know, nothing that's happening in the world today really surprises me much because, I mean, I tell you, you get into a, a profession like that and there isn't much in the world that's going to surprise you by the behavior of anybody, really. And so that's what structured me. And the man that hired me, who was the chief of police, is still my mentor today, whether it was art or law enforcement, it sort of correlated to everything I did. And it was, he always, the one thing I always remember him telling me is never pick a dog when they're down. And that has always resonated with me. So, you know, I have, it really taught me a lot about humility and, um, Kind of my motto today which is silent power i just got through making a t-shirt with that and so because my time's getting short i will move on to where that led me to and so i got back into my painting i worked a few other jobs and i moved on to a, a place where i worked for our ancient ruin site kuya cliff dwellings and that's where i decided to leave profession uh, I was running the cliffs and managing a gift shop that I brought from nothing to everything. It taught me a lot about entrepreneurship, and I just translated that to myself as an artist. And I think the creative process for me is this solitude, my mind, my life, my head, um, the skill. I think that the one thing about my art is I work every single day. I get up at four in the morning. And I'm usually in here. I spend all day in here, go for walks, do my errands. And that's my creative process because I think technique and skill bring you this sort of uh, place of near perfection. I don't believe in perfection, but I think it bring, brings you to this place of, of artistry that I that is good for me. And over the years, because of the recession and now the pandemic, I, it taught me to become a better businesswoman and to expand what I do. And so I, was, I, I had thought very carefully about how I was going to expand what I did to allow everybody to own my artwork. And now really isn't the time for me to be selling original $1,000, $5,000 paintings, although I'm working on paintings. Opportunity has kind of knocked at my door. And I was able to do my first ginormous wall mural in Albuquerque at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center this, this summer. And, and um, it brought on a, a very huge, what I call paycheck. And so that was the thing that happened before the pandemic started, but because I signed a contract, and those are things that I think as artists we really have to learn too, is how to, how to work contracts, how to do bigger projects. I'm working on a book illustration, or the book deal now with a, a publishing company in, in, company in New York where I'm illustrating my second children's book. 
And so those are things I think that as artists, we, at least for me anyway, I've really had to force myself to learn to work in the bigger pictures of things. And it's helped me because those projects are what enables me to survive all year long and not be afraid. And I'm really honest about uh, when I'm talking about an entrepreneurship, it involves everything, even the honesty of uh, managing and staying out of personal debt. All of these things, I think, play a big role in who we are as successful artists, if that's what you choose to be. And that's what I am. I choose to be there because I don't want to do anything else, really. I'm, I'm not old, but I'm not young either. You know, I look in the mirror and I think, oh, God, what's happening? I'm, I'm getting to that place where, you know, I can kind of coast a little bit. And, you know, over the years, um, like everyone, I have faced a lot of loss in my life. I've lost, I'm, I have no more siblings. I lost my dad and my sister in one year. Um, I don't talk about it much, but my son is still alive, but I lost him years ago to um, crime and drugs and gangs. And so I don't know whether it's worse or not, but I, I know I will never see him again. He made it very, very clear. I haven't seen him. And I just know one day I'll, I'll find out he's not here anymore. So I, I grapple with those things. Those are what I think makes my art even stronger because I have to, I have to remain strong and yet my heart breaks, you know. Um, but I think those are the things that make me very, very strong. I, I try very hard to not get over it. I don't like those kinds of things, but I learn to put things in their place. And I just think about the beautiful times when I held my little kid in my arms. And those are what really keep me going. So I, I know it's, it's Steve's time, but I'm just going to show you a few things that I've done um, since the pandemic started uh, to kind of, I don't know, always have myself out there and hopefully people will like what I do. But, um, and this is my studio back here. It's all, it's my white cloud, my haven. I, I work a lot to get here. But um, just quickly, some of the new things I've done is I'm working on some beautiful box purses and I'm going to line the insides of them. Uh, so I, I like to fool around with just accessories. <clears throat> I'm, pre I'm branding things now. So I'm creating, I, these are my micro geos. They're little baby shoes and packaging is really, I love that kind of stuff. So I paint shoes. I, I have, these are my mini geos. So the micros are babies, the minis are kids, and then the the um, the uh, the adult shoes are just big geos. And those are these. And the reason I call them geos is because all of my stuff is geometric. So these are my big sellers, are my my kind of Converse type shoes, and um, those, those are, are awesome. <laughs> So I, I do stuff like that, and then I do more uh, like fancier shoes, and then wow. um, for the young women and women that like to wear high heels, I'll do platform shoes. And the, the thing that I think kept me alive in April and May after the herd, you know, we all came back from the herd terrified, thinking we all had the coronavirus. All of a sudden, masks were just everywhere and so michelle had to jump on the jet bandwagon too and i decided to paint masks and now i am designing them and ordering them through companies but my hand painted ones um and my buddies in california my they helped me out too so and i perfected them now i include these little braces so you can breathe and adjustable stuff I have a lot of show and tell. And then I, I paint little bags. And these I got in, when I was up in the village when um, ceremonial things would happen and you don't dare carry your cell phone, but you have to have it. So I sneaked it in and hid, it, hid it in there with my, um, my cornmeal pouch. But now they're kind of sellable because they're little crossbody bags. 
And then what I've sold for years are my card packs of my paintings, my sister cards. I've got my Christmas cards now. Um, prints with stories. I write poems about everything. And I think marketing yourself is always highly important. I've got two websites, one for my jury kind of shows and the other for all this stuff that isn't allowable into those things. My, uh, my brochure, I always thought, what taught me was I, I would go along Indian market most of the time and I find everybody's cards on the streets or their brochures thrown, thrown in the trash. And I thought, that's a shame. You know, so I thought, well, I'll make something that most people, I found these in the trash too, but most of the time, not too often. Uh, I'll make a beautiful card that somebody will keep. And my business card. And my computer tech, who is my husband, Murphy, um, he's hard at work. I keep him very busy, but he's my business partner. He, co he quits being my husband when workday starts. And, you know, he says, I know, I know, <laughs> but we're a team. And then I do uh, scarves. So, wow. Yeah. So I think um, for me, and I work with museum shops, the Smithsonian, the Herd, the Cultural Center, the Museums of New Mexico, all kinds of things. And just that is how I have become what I think is my own little uh, definition of entrepreneurship. So with that, I'm going to say sign off and thank you all for listening to me uh, and i really appreciate it so thank you mm -hmm.